This isn't your average job. Holy cow! Being a National Geographic photographer isn't easy. Boom! If you are under pressure of time, you have to take any option. They defy danger. You can surface from a dive and get swept out to sea in, in no time at all. And sometimes prepare for the worst. Oh, shit, sunshine. Always on a quest for that perfect shot. And now we're counting down Nat Geo's top 10 photos of 2010. In the field, what a photographer experiences is immediate. Oh, man. They travel to the ends of the earth. Seems like the first step in a thousand mile journey. <laughs> to get the most striking, memorable photos to tell a story. Every year, we make about a million and a half photographs. And roughly 1,000 appear on the pages of our magazine. What we would like to have happen with these top 10 photographs is for all of us to look at the photographs and understand this complex, fascinating world we live in and inspire people to take action and to make the world a better place for us all. Wes Giles came to us and told us about a magic place in the Bahamas these blue holes where fresh water, seawater mix, one of the most dangerous places to dive in the world. There's this incredible dynamic flow that, that surges through these caves. If you get caught in one of those things when it's sucking, you die. This is a hydrogen sulfide environment. It's poisonous and toxic. We feel the effects when we're down in it. We have to limit our exposure. The Blue Holes of the Bahamas is one of those stories that I've wanted to do for 20 years. The project took almost a year to photograph. Wes chooses for his photo a place 24 meters underwater called the Cascade Room. When you get into the Cascade Room, all of a sudden, boom, you're in it. You're in one of the most beautiful places on Earth. The Cascade Room photograph was a real endeavor. And my goal was to capture an image that translated to the audience of what it feels like to be down inside the earth. All underwater cave photography is hard. We have uh, no real communication to talk to people. We are. 100% dependent on a very, very talented team to operate lights and strobes and perform complex and difficult diving maneuvers. This is a complex picture. I had to figure out a way to do a transect line that will allow me to keep the camera at the same depth and keep it at the same angle in a cave. I had to find this spot that I could do this. I took it as a series of photographs. Only the central corridor would be lit and that above it would be black and below it would be black. Wes took great risk in these photographs. The long, narrow composition as he stitched picture after picture together so thoughtfully to make this compelling image that captures the mystery. A assignment like this 
My photo count was 34,000 photographs. A great photograph is pure magic, and it's amazing how seldom it actually occurs. I chose Wes Skiles' picture because he takes us to a place we've never seen before. It's a celebration of the diversity of the world, and it's a celebration of exploration. This isn't your average martial arts academy. Here, 20,000 students practice kung fu forms inspired by the legendary martial arts of the Shaolin Temple. The image that was selected for this year was taken at the Shaolin Tago Martial Arts School in Dengfeng, uh, Henan, China. What we wanted to do was try to show what is Shaolin Kung Fu today. It's a sports store, there's a lot of peak action, and yet you can't have every picture be of somebody throwing a kung fu kick, and you know, you've got to really kind of look beyond that and take it back to the essence of the narrative approach. Fritz Hoffman didn't just happen to get an assignment in China. He's lived here and speaks fluent Mandarin. And yeah, when I was photographing in the schools, I tried not to talk too much to the kids because then it takes their attention away from what they're doing, which is what I want to photograph. But at some breaks, you know, I would loosen them up a little bit and get some of their information, you know, where they're from, how did they get to the school, which was always a blast because they're just so eager to be able to talk to a foreigner. Somebody who can speak with them in their own, you know, language. Fritz Hoffman is a great photographer because he has the ability to blend in, especially in China. He's lived there for years. He understands the culture, he understands the people, and they immediately respect him because of his grasp of the culture and the language. It's always such an advantage to be able to communicate with the people that I'm photographing in China. And um, oftentimes, I'll just kind of keep quiet and hear, listen to the, the discussion. In the blink of an eye, Fritz finds a moment. Even though it was uh, the dead of winter and below freezing, the kids were so focused and, and disciplined. The biggest challenge for this photo was just seeing it first and then being quick about getting it because it didn't last very long. What we're seeing in this image, it's the start of the class, start of the day for these students who are, who are training. Uh, they have these staffs that they use for sparring with each other. But what they're doing here is they've warmed up, been through the warm-up exercises, and they're crouched there listening to their coach who's disciplining them for the previous day and just reminding them you know, what they need to work on uh, to be a better student. It's a nice little moment, you know, it reminds me of child's excitement about the life ahead. Because you see that in their eyes, that this is my commitment to my life. I got about two frames on this and then just moved on to the next. But really, in the end, it's not until you get back into the, the office and you're editing through and trying to create sequences for the narrative where you actually start to really kind of cut down uh, and make pairings of images. This photo transcends the article because of the honest, open expressions on the young men's faces with their staffs, the eagerness in their eyes, their anticipation of what they can learn. That becomes universal. That touches us all.
we as human beings have to do better than this. I looked at Mark Leone's photograph of an Asian black bear having bowel removed, the bear's tranquilized, and I was shocked and saddened. That became the lead picture to a powerful story on the Asian wildlife trade. This is an illegal practice in Vietnam, and Mark had to go to great lengths to make this picture. The sign was to cover the uh, Asian wildlife trade, not just the commerce aspects, you know, or the legal enforcement against it, but also the cultural background, the conservation, and as well as the consumerism. This was shot over three years. I thought when I was going in that this might be risky because a lot of this stuff is illegal activity. And you don't know who is behind the legal activity. There's deals going on where the officials are also controlling the trade. You know, I didn't know who to trust when I was working. I just would be very low key. I could just, you know, go into place and be very friendly, very curious, and do some shooting. For this bear picture, I was shooting in Hanoi, and if you go out an hour out of town, there's areas, there's these highway areas where you'll just find all these bear bile farms, just one after another, and so we just drove out there. Finding them wasn't that hard. The hard part is getting to take pictures. I was about an hour outside of Hanoi, and it was around 10 in the morning. When you go into these bear farms, they, uh, the reason the bears are there is to be extracted for bile. They go, they stick a tube in the gallbladder, and they just pump out the, the, uh, the bile. This bile is, is supposedly good for a male impotence, for hangover cures, for liver disease. So the bear's in the cage, like two meters by two meters by two meters, and drag the bear towards the edge of the cage. And the bear, it's frightened, and, and so they stick a, a needle in its paw, and then 10 minutes later, the bear's out cold, and then they can drag it outside the cage. And they had a small portable ultrasound machine. They put the jelly on to try to look at the gallbladder with the ultrasound. So once they find the gallbladder, then they can stick the tube in, and then they pump it out for like 10 minutes and all this kind of this yellow green liquid comes out of the gallbladder and comes in a little bottle. After a certain point, the bear won't be doing this anymore and then they kill him and because also the bear body parts are also worth something on the market. If Mark went in as a National Geographic magazine photographer, he would under no circumstances get the picture of this black bear in this dire situation. Mark was at risk continually. You're dealing with organized crime, and uh, to be discovered could make a, a situation that could be extraordinarily dangerous. This story helped clean up some corruption in Asia in the wildlife trade. It changed some legislation in some nations in Asia and made people really think about what kind of a relationship we want to have throughout the world with wild animals. When David Lichfarger came to us and said he wanted to do a series of stories on life in one cubic foot, I thought he must be mad. This isn't your average school of fish. He's got this green box, one foot by one foot by one foot by one foot. And he's going to take that into a coral reef, plunk it down underwater, obviously, and then he's going to see what passes through that box. And if it doesn't pass through the box, he doesn't photograph it. The idea of looking at a small place very closely and carefully comes from an Edward O. Wilson quote about, it is possible to spend a lifetime on a Magellanic voyage around the base of a single tree. The idea is how much life can fit in your lap. The sort of predetermined size is one cubic foot. David photographs one cubic foot in five different places around the world. It's part of an unusual assignment for National Geographic magazine. 
It is a stainless steel quarter inch rod welded and it can be taken apart. So you can carry it up a tree or take it out on a coral reef. David sets up his cubic foot everywhere. We made a list of predetermined habitat types, a coral reef, a cloud forest canopy, a shrubland, some leaf litter, which we did in uh, New York City in Central Park. You want to choose the best spot. And once I chose a spot, I'm sort of committed. OK, so it's going to be something like this, except we're going to take off the bottom and sink it. It's intended to be kind of a representation of that cubic foot over the course of a normal day to find the creatures in the soil. We took the soil sample and the leaf litter sample to the American Museum of Natural History, to the entomology department, and they helped us sort it out. Central Park, the most heavily visited urban park in the world. These are not remote, pristine places, but they still have tremendous abundance of life that we should take care of because it can feed the wonder of the world. No matter where he is, the whole cubic foot mess has to be bagged and taken to a lab for further study and photography. It's in Marea, French Polynesia, that David's choice photo is born. The hundreds of different shapes and forms that live on the coral reef crest in this small area, I mean, it's like a miniature version of a skyscraper. Everything is in layers. Everybody is on top of each other. But the thing that makes it work is this huge flow of water in Morea, in this particular spot, it's so well studied and documented that they, we actually were able to accomplish the identification of each creature. And we calculated that it was more than 40,000 creatures per hour were in the water column that are feeding and supporting that stationary spot. That's a nice crab, good smell. David takes his favorite sea critters and photographs them one by one. He then takes them to his photo editor, Todd James. David came back from the field and dumped 44,260 pictures and then smiled and walked away. Um, I cried. <laughs> so we knew we wanted to do collages, but it wasn't until we got to the page that we started to figure out, you know, at what size can they work? You can see each individual. Others, they run smaller, and you can kind of just get a sense of the diversity of life in that area. I chose this photograph because every time I see it, I see something different. It is so complex, so interesting. It's a photograph I want to sit down and spend time with. I think that uh, that spotted uh, boxfish is, is, she's very fetching. And, um, you know, I like the way she's looking out of her eye. I mean, honestly, if I'm reincarnated, I'm going to come back as a boxfish and look her up. There's a tremendous amount of life, you know, in a small area. It's a magnificent opportunity to just sit and really closely observe how a little piece of an ecosystem functions. Imagine. You're a woman or a child in Northern Kenya. Every day of your life, you spend eight to 12 hours a day just gathering water. That's all you do. And if you don't gather the water, your family goes thirsty. This particular story had to fit in a mix because of the water issue. You know, it's playing a role within the mix of stories. So as a photographer, I needed to understand what that role was. Well, I think the message about water is we don't have enough. And 
when you don't have enough, the burden of gathering water is extreme. And the purpose of the story was to show the impact of women's search for water and their gathering of water. What is the impact of that on their lives? I think we forget in our comfortable lives that most people live on a margin that is something that we might not even be able to survive. I think the women in their just everyday physical lives showed us all that it was an incredible burden on their lives. They are perceived as beasts of burden by the family, but they know, they know this is how they'll live. They're gathering water from the age of three, four, as soon as they can walk. Well, this was in the middle of the day. We had been traveling uh, through the desert and saw a few women kind of by the roadside. Soon, uh, another woman joined them, and then another woman and a child, and, and this group started to grow. I just stayed to hang out with them and, and photograph. And by the way, they're carrying like 100 pounds of water. I only have two little cameras on me. And I'm like, to keep up with these, they are hardcore and very powerful, powerful human beings. The women started to spread out to go to their individual villages. I thought, oh my God, this, this is the moment. You couldn't appreciate their burden and the, and the kind of landscape that they have to trudge across every day. So by being higher, we could actually see what they're faced with. So I got on the roof of the car and we very, very, very slowly followed, and very quietly followed the ladies. So I was actually shooting from the roof of the car. Lynn can see a photo developing. When I first saw Lynn's photograph, I immediately knew that that picture was the way to set up this incredible saga they go through in their lives every day to gather water. If she would have taken this in low, early morning, late evening, dramatic light, you wouldn't get that sense of harshness. The contrast between the desert floor, this arid, arid area, and the blue, blue sky, and this endless journey. There's an, a feeling of endlessness of this picture, of a trek that just continues on and on and on, day after day after day, a trek of survival for the women and for their families.